So in this video we're going to discuss the stronger notion of convergence for a sequence of functions that is known as uniform convergence. So I've drawn this basic picture here to illustrate how uniform convergence is not a totally separate definition of convergence, where you have a totally separate limit, no. Rather, it's a stronger concept that builds on top of the concept of convergence for sequences of functions that we've already seen. So if this circle here represents the set of all convergent sequences of functions, then the set of uniformly convergent sequences of functions is a subset of this. So all sequences that converge uniformly to a limit, they also converge pointwise according to the basic definition that we've already seen to that limit. But there are loads of sequences that do converge pointwise with the basic definition of convergence that don't meet this added stronger criterion for us to be able to say that they converge uniformly to that limit. So it's an added criterion on top of the criterion that we've already seen for convergence to a limit full stop. And the reason that we need this stronger criterion is that a whole bunch of beautiful theorems that we would like to be true about sequences of functions that converge to a limit don't hold true with the basic notion of convergence that we've already seen. But if they obey this heightened version, which is uniform convergence, then suddenly they magically become true. So I've written here an example of one of these beautiful theorems that I refer to that holds true if you have a uniform convergence, but not if you just have mere pointwise convergence. Now, we're not going to prove this theorem here. This is just here as motivation for this concept of uniform convergence. So if you consider a sequence of functions, fn, and let's say that this sequence of functions converges pointwise to this limit function f, and all of these functions are, of course, defined over some domain that we'll call d. And let's now say that this, all the functions in this sequence of functions are integrable over that domain d. So we could consider what the integral over d of fn dx is for all of those functions, i.e. for all n as an element of the natural numbers. We can then consider the sequence of real numbers that is the sequence of integrals, where the first term in this um, sequence is just the integral of the first function, f1, over the domain. The second term is then just the integral of the second function over the domain. And we can build a sequence of real numbers, which is all of the values of these integrals. And we can then ask, does that sequence of real numbers converge um, if the sequence of functions converges to this value f? Is there a limit of this sequence of integrals? And the answer is, Unfortunately, the fact that it converges pointwise doesn't guarantee that this sequence of values of the integrals will actually converge. You can come up with quite simple counterexamples where you have pointwise convergence to a function, but when you look at the sequence of integrals, it goes off and diverges to infinity. However, if you have this stronger notion of convergence, which is uniform convergence to this limit f, then yes, you can conclude that the limit of the sequence of integrals does exist, and moreover, it converges to the value of the integral of the limit over the domain, i.e. it converges to the integral over d of f dx. And here I've just put in kind of the intermediate, that it converges to the integral over the domain of the limit of the sequence of functions, which of course is f dx. So, when we have this stronger notion of uniform convergence, we can kind of swap the integral and the limit here, which is kind of a beautiful um, theorem. And as I say, this doesn't hold true, this theorem, if you've only got mere pointwise convergence to this limit f, but if you've got the stronger uniform convergence to this limit f, then this theorem holds true. And as I say, we'll prove this in some subsequent video, but this is just to give you motivation for why this concept of uniform convergence is important. So let's now try and build the notion of uniform convergence then. So how we're going to get there is by first examining carefully the notion that we already have of convergence, this pointwise notion of convergence, and seeing what we can strengthen about this condition. 
So let's examine pointwise convergence in more detail then. So let's say we have a sequence of functions f defined over some domain d that converge pointwise to this limit f, which again is a function over this domain d. What this means, remember, is that if you take any x in the domain and you consider this sequence of real numbers that is what you get if you evaluate the sequence of functions at your point x, then that sequence of real numbers converges, so the limit as n approaches infinity of fn evaluated at x, that is the sequence of functions evaluated at x, which is now a sequence of real numbers, this exists and this converges to the value of our limit function at x, and that holds true for all x. So at each one of the points in the domain, the if you evaluate the sequence of functions at that point, you get a sequence of real numbers, and that converges to the value of the limit function at that point. So I've just drawn a picture here to illustrate this as well. So this interval here is representing our domain D. The black lines are representing the functions in the sequence. The red line is representing our limit function F. And then this definition this basic definition of convergence, pointwise convergence, is that if you go to any x, which is what is represented by this blue line here, uh, the line of constant x value, in the domain, then you can evaluate all of the functions in the sequence of functions at that point, and you'll get some value, and then what you end up with is a sequence of real numbers, and that that sequence of real numbers converges to the value of um, the limit evaluated at x. Um, so just to make this clear, these functions in the sequence, we were progressing in this direction towards the limit in red there. Now I'm afraid it's time to bring out the epsilon definition of this limit of the sequence of real numbers converging to this value here. So this being true means that for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists a big N as an element of the natural numbers, such that if little n is greater than or equal to big N, so if you go to a term of the sequence that is, e that is at big N or beyond big N, then if you look at the distance between that term of the sequence and the value of the limit, so the term of the sequence is Fn evaluated at x, the limit is F evaluated at x, if you look at the distance between them, it is less than epsilon. So this sequence gets and stays indefinitely close to the value of the limit. That's the epsilon definition. So drawing this on the picture, if you imagine putting some epsilon interval around the value of your limit, f of x here, there is some big N such that if you go to that term in the sequence of real numbers, which is the sequence of functions evaluated at x, then at that term and for all the terms beyond it, they are all inside that epsilon interval around your limit. And this, of course, holds true for all x in your domain. So, in fact, you can go to any x in this domain here, and you can look at the value of the limit function at that point, um, and then you can draw an epsilon interval around that, and again, there will be some big N such that if you go to that term it's in, uh, and you look at what the uh, value of the function at your point at that value big N is, uh, then it will be inside this epsilon interval and all things beyond it will be inside that epsilon interval as well. The thing is here, what I can do is I can put an epsilon interval around my limit function here so I'm imagining putting a limit, uh, an epsilon interval around every single um, point's limit value. And it is true that I can always find a big N such that at that point, the sequence of real numbers from that term and for all terms onwards is inside that epsilon interval. But the thing is that that big N that you need will be dependent potentially on which x point you choose in the domain, i.e. it's not the same big N isn't necessarily going to work for every single point. So at this point here, we might have one big N that works and gets you inside that epsilon interval around the value of the limit. But if we go to another point here, it might be a different big N, it might be potentially a bigger big N that you need. 
uh, in order to satisfy that definition and be inside this epsilon interval and all terms beyond it be inside that epsilon interval around the value of the limit. So this big N that you need is going to be potentially dependent on your x value. And what that corresponds to is the fact that these pointwise sequences might be converging to that limit at different rates. They're not converging necessarily uniformly uh, to their limits. They might be converging at different rates depending on what point you're at in this definition. And that's what we're going to strengthen. We're going to make them all have to converge to their limits at some sort of uniform rate. That's how we're going to strengthen it and come up with this concept of uniform convergence. A concrete example now, the example that we've used previously, let's take the sequence of functions fnx to be 1 over 1 plus nx, where the domain is the closed interval from 0 to 1. And I've drawn some pictures of the first few of these here. So here is our domain, 0, 1. And then this represents the first one. So put in 1 here and we get the function 1 over 1 plus x. At 0, uh, 1 over 1 plus 0 will be 1, so up here. And then in between it will be some sort of hyperbola. And then at the other end of the interval, where x is equal to 1, we'll have 1 over 1 plus 1, so 1 over 2. Uh, so it comes down to a half and then it is a hyperbola in between. Then if you go up to the second one, f2 of x, then we'll have 1 over 1 plus 2x. Again, x is equal to 0, this bit doesn't matter, so it will still be up at 1. In fact, for all of them, uh, at 0, it will still be up at 1. But then in between, it will still be a hyperbola, but it will be coming down to something lower at the other end now, because we'll have 1 over 1 plus 2 times 1, so that will be one third, and you can see that as n gets bigger, the value at the far end of the interval will get smaller and smaller. Now this sequence of functions does have a limit. You can see that it's getting closer and closer and closer to zero as you uh, go on here. And in fact, the limit as n approaches infinity of our sequence of functions is equal to zero everywhere on the domain except for at zero itself where it remains one. And the reason for this is that if we just use the definition, so we just need to now take a specific x in the domain and then consider the sequence of real numbers that you get from the sequence of functions by evaluating the functions at x. So that will be this sequence, limit as n approaches infinity of 1 over 1 plus nx, where we now view x as a constant. Now, if x is 0, of course, that bit completely goes. So we just get a constant sequence, which is 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, which does have a limit, and that limit is 1, and therefore the limit function uh, needs to be 1 at x is equal to 0. But for all the other x's that are non-zero in this domain, this bit won't go. And even if x is absolutely tiny, like 0.0000001, this n is going to infinity, so at some point it will totally dominate over that, and this denominator will become enormous, and therefore this thing will converge off to zero. Um, so no matter what your x is, as long as it's not zero, any other value in this domain, this sequence of real numbers, as n goes to infinity, will converge to zero, and therefore the limit function is zero everywhere on the domain apart from at zero. So what I want to illustrate to you is the different rate of convergence at different parts of the domain. So intuitively, what you can see is that over here, the sequence is converging to the limit, which is zero, quicker than it is if you go right over here. So it's going to take longer for the bits that are really close to zero to be getting closer to their limit, which is zero, than it is for the bits over here. So let's take a concrete example to illustrate this. So we'll take epsilon is equal to one-tenth, and we'll take the two points in our domain, x is equal to 0 0.9, i.e. a point over here, and x is equal to 0 0.01, so a point really close to zero. And I want to illustrate to you that to satisfy the definition of convergence to zero, for this epsilon is equal to one-tenth, we require a much bigger n for this point, which is really close to zero, than we do for this point, i.e. this over here, it's converging to zero slower than it is over here. So let's start with 0 0.9. So what I've written here is I've put in for x 
nine tenths now, and then we get this sequence of real numbers, one over one plus nine n over ten, uh, as n goes off to infinity, um, and we want to know what range of n values is it the case that if you look at what the distance between these terms of the sequence and the limit, which is zero, um, we want that to be now less than this epsilon value, which is one tenth. We want to find a range of n values. In particular, we want to find a big n such that if you look at all the little n that is bigger than that, that this inequality holds true. So simplifying this down, taking off zero has no effects. So we can get rid of that. So we've just got mod of this thing. But the numerator is positive, the denominator is positive, because m, remember, is always a natural number, which is always a positive number. So we can just get rid of the modular sign. So we just want this thing to be less than one-tenth then. So because both 10 and 1 plus 9n over 10 are both positive numbers, we can multiply both sides by them. So we multiply both sides by 10, and we multiply both sides by 1 plus 9n over 10. And that leads to this rearrangement. We end up with 10 is greater than 1 plus 9n over 10. So all we've really done is bring this up here and this up here. And we can do that without having to worry about flipping the sign of the inequality because both things are positive. So now just subtract 1 from both sides and we end up with 9 needs to be less than 9n over 10. And then we can just multiply both sides by 10 and divide through by 9 and we get that n needs to be greater than 10. So if you pick any natural number n that is greater than 10, this inequality will be satisfied. So in particular, I can make big N equal to 11 and then it is true that for all little n greater than or equal to 11 that this inequality will be satisfied. So big N is equal to 11 in this case. So I've removed all the working, but we've got that big N is equal to 11 in the case of X is equal to 0 0.9 with epsilon equal 1 over 10. So now let's go to X is equal to 0 0.01, again with the same epsilon, and find the big N here, and we're expecting it to be much bigger. So again, what we are looking for is a range of little n values such that this inequality is true. So what I've done now is I've substituted in x is equal to 0 0.01, i.e. 1 over 100. So we've got 1 over 1 plus n over 100. And I haven't bothered putting the minus 0 because that makes no difference. But of course, that should really be there for the definition of the limit. And we want to find a range of n values such that the difference between the sequence values and the limit is less than uh, this epsilon value, which is one tenth. So again, this thing in the modular sign is positive, so we can get rid of the modular sign because the numerator is positive, the denominator is always positive, so this fraction is positive, so we don't need the absolute value sign, so we can just conclude that one over one plus n over 100 must be less than one tenth. So again, simple rearrangement, because both of these denominators are positive, we can bring the 10 up here in the 1 plus n over 100 up here without flipping the sign of the inequality. So we get that 10 needs to be less than 1 plus n over 100. So now just subtracting the 1 from both sides, and we get that n over 100 must be greater than 9. And then finally, multiplying both sides through by 100, because it's a positive number, so we don't need to flip the sign of the inequality. And we get that little n must be greater than 900. So this inequality is going to be true in this range of little n values. So n is greater than 900. Any natural number you take that is greater than 900, then this inequality will hold true. So in particular, we can set big N equal to 901, and then it will be true that for little n greater than or equal to that big N value, that the inequality holds true. So at this point, x is equal to 0 0.9. The big N to get it within this epsilon is equal to 1 tenth was only 11, whereas at this point, x is equal to 0 0.01. The necessary big N to get within an epsilon of 1 tenth of the limit is n is equal to 901. So I hope that nicely illustrates to you that at different points in your domain, the necessary big N for the same epsilon can be very, very different. So with our definition currently, our pointwise definition of convergence of a sequence of functions, the convergence at different parts of your domain may be at very different rates. That's what we're going to change when we now create this stronger notion of uniform convergence. We're going to demand that the convergence 
at all parts of your domain is at some sort of uniform rate, and I'll show you how to do that in the next video.